Inserting the green fluorescent protein gene of Aecoria victoria, more commonly known as the crystal jelly, from the plasmid PGLO into the plasmid PTXB1 by Seschneider from WF West High School in Chehalis, Washington. Previous experiments attempting to clone the green fluorescent protein, or GFP gene, into the round DNA plasmid PUC19 have been unsuccessful in achieving a significant glowing phenotype of the gene. Instead, no glow, or dim glow, has been the result of these experiments. Through collaboration with my molecular genetics teacher, Mr. Henry Weeks, two hypotheses have been supposed to explain this lack of GFP expression. The first hypothesis for this lack of GFP expression concerns the fact that when the GFP gene is cloned into, plas into the plasmid PUC19, there are about 16 extra amino acids coded for between the start codon of transcription and the start of the GFP gene itself, represented by the red box in the PowerPoint. This means that 16 extra amino acids are added onto the protein, possibly changing its shape. This change is enough to decrease the expression of the gene. The second hypothesis deals with the plasmid PUC19 itself and the lac operon contained inside of it. PUC19 is a relaxed plasmid, meaning that when it is transformed into E. coli, the E. coli make about 200 copies of PUC19 each. This means that whenever insert was cloned into PUC19, in this case the GFP gene, that insert is also copied 200 times. Now in order for the GFP gene to be expressed, RNA polymerase must transcribe its DNA sequence and create the mRNA that ribosomes read and translate into amino acids that connect together to form the protein that glows. Normally, the transcription by RNA polymerase is regulated through the use of repressors and isopropyl beta D1 thiocalactopyranocyte, or IPTG. The repressors in the E. coli cell bind right before the GFP gene sequence and stop RNA polymerase from transcribing. When IPTG is introduced, it induces transcription by removing the repressor, allowing RNA polymerase to start reading the DNA. However, because there are so many PUC19 plasmids in the E. coli cell, there may not be enough repressors to go around. Thus, those plasmids that do not have the repressor are able to be transcribed by RNA polymerase. This means that GFP is constantly being produced and expressed. The hypothesis is that because of the lack of repressors, the cell uses so much of its resources and energy to produce GFP that it cannot continue normal cell functions, and as a result, it either stops growing or loses the plasmid entirely, effectively stopping the reproduction of the PUC19 slash GFP plasmid and leading to less expression of the gene when the E. coli cells finish growing. In order to surpass these problems, I needed a new plasmid to contrast with PUC19. Through connections with an NEB consultant facilitated by Mr. Weeks, the plasmid PTXB1 was located and chosen. PTXB1 is different from PUC19 because it is a lower copy number plasmid, meaning that E. coli only makes about 20 copies of it when it is transformed, not 200 instead of like PUC19. That is a reduction of 90%. This fact leads to the first part of the hypothesis for this experiment, which is this. Because there are less plasmids being copied by E. coli, there will be enough repressors in the system to be able to regulate the expression of the GFP gene through the use of IPTG. Furthermore, PTXB1 only has 10 amino acids coded for between the start codon of transcription and the GFP gene, decreasing the amount of amino acids added to the protein itself by 37.5%. This leads to the second part of the hypothesis for this experiment. Because there are less amino acids being added to the GFP protein, the change in its, in its shape will not be as significant, leading to increased gene expression. Now in order to clone the GFP gene into PTXB1, there had to be matching restriction sites on both pieces of DNA. PST1 cuts once just after the GFP gene, and once in PTXB1, making it an ideal choice for one restriction enzyme. The other enzyme was narrowed down by the number of cuts it made in both DNA pieces. It turned out to be NOT1. However, NOT1's restriction site was only present in PTXB1, so it needed to be introduced into the, into the GFP sequence by restriction site generating polymerase chain reaction. 
This technique requires that not one's restriction site be incorporated onto the end of the F1 primer when PCR cloning the GFPG. After the PCR rea reaction has taken place, the product will be purified, then it and its vector will be restricted, purified again, and then ligated into each other. The ligation will then be transformed into E. coli and grown overnight to see if the colonies produced exhibit the glowing phenotype of the GFPG, and then a verification step will be done. The results of this lab have not been determined as of yet, and an updated lab report will be submitted at the BioExpo in May. I would like to acknowledge God for making this experiment possible, Mr. Henry Weeks for guiding me along this path, Mrs. Wendy Neal for her ever-present encouraging words, Mrs. Darlene Weeks for her amazing logistical support and expertise, my genetics classmates for being such a great group of people to be around, and of course my parents for allowing me to stay late at the lab multiple nights in a row. Thank you for listening to this presentation of my research project.